All right, folks, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Pat Kane, Public Programs and Visitor Services Coordinator at the Museum of the Grand Prairie, part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. I want to thank you all so much for tuning in tonight, uh, joining us tonight as we kick off our annual Garden Speaker Series, our virtual Garden Speaker Series yet again this year. Um, and I want to especially thank uh, tonight's presenter, uh, Kathleen Hull, for providing our program titled Medicinal Plants and Their Use. Uh, Kathleen will join us in just a few short moments. Uh, before we get into tonight's program, I did want to go over a few housekeeping items and let you know what's coming up at the Museum of the Grand Prairie um, and Champaign County Forest Preserve District. Uh, first, before I do that, uh, would love to know where you all are watching from tonight. I already have some folks chiming in in the comments section, letting us know where you're tuning in from. Always love to see where folks are watching these programs from. Uh, Deb is tuning in from Urbana. Sarah tuning in from Howell, Michigan. Uh, Kathy says hi from Terre Haute, Indiana. Uh, William in Missouri. Uh, Sean from here in Central Illinois, here in Champaign County. Uh, Tolono. Uh, Gina from West Westphalia, Indiana. Marilyn from Clinton. Roseanne from Kankakee. Susan all the way from Northern Michigan. Marie from Michigan as well. Uh, uh, Katrin tuning in all the way from Connecticut. And Jan from Savoy. Thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. Uh, if you haven't done so already, let us know where you're watching from in the comments section down below. Also, if you have a question or another comment uh, during tonight's program, feel free to drop that in the comments section also. Um, a little bit about us um, uh, here at the Museum of the Grand Prairie and Champaign County Forest Preserve District. If you've never heard about us, uh, Museum of the Grand Prairie opened originally as the Early American Museum in 1968. Um, and our current mission is to collect, preserve, and interpret the cultural and natural history of Champaign County and East Central Illinois for all generations. We're part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, uh, which includes a collection of seven forest preserves here in East Central Illinois and Champaign County. Uh, also, two educational facilities, including our museum, Museum of the Grand Prairie, as well as the Homer Lake Interpretive Center. Uh, Lake of the Woods Golf Course, also included in the Forest Preserve District, um, as well as uh, Kickapoo Rail Trail and so much more. So get out and explore uh, Champaign County Forest Preserve District and the outdoors if you are local to East Central Illinois. Or pay us a visit sometime. If you're traveling through the area, come and see us at the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. Um, also, we would love to hear from you tonight. Um, uh, after tonight's program, uh, feel free to take this very short and simple uh, program survey that I am dropping into the chat right now. Um, after tonight's program, let us know what you thought of tonight's program. And then also, if you have some ideas or, or um, uh, suggestions for future programming, feel free to let us know about that in this survey link that I just dropped into the chat. Um, uh, a few programs coming up in the near future. Uh, some other things to let you know about. Our next program in this Garden Speaker Series is going to happen on Thursday, February 17th. And again, it'll stream live on our Facebook and YouTube pages, much like tonight's program is. Um, it will be titled uh, Medicine and Materia Medica in the Illinois Country. Uh, Bethany Elkington, James Graham, and Bernard Santisario of the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences in the College of Pharmacy at the University of Illinois Chicago will explore the history of medicine and materia medica from the frontier from the frontier days in the Illinois country to the present day. They will also tell us a little bit about um, the Atkins Medicinal Plant Garden um, at the University of Illinois Chicago College of Pharmacy at that particular program. Uh, talk about their involvement with that uh, project as well as talking about um, uh, medicine in the Illinois country. Um, uh, today, January 20th, here uh, at the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, we began what is called the CCFPD Snowflake Search. Uh, we did this last year. We've hidden 40 creatively painted and, and very unique uh, uh, snowflake tree cookies that are hidden throughout our seven forest preserves. And we're encouraging you all, uh, if you're local, to go out and find them this winter. Um, uh, and we encourage you that when you find those, snap a photo um, and use the hashtag CCFPD Snowflake Search on Facebook and Instagram. Each one of those snowflakes, as I mentioned, hidden throughout the Champaign County Forest Preserve District um, on trails and near popular areas, uh, also includes some winter fun facts and historically themed or environmentally themed 
fun facts associated with the winter time with those awesome snowflakes. Um, uh, so again, uh, find the hashtag CCFPD snowflake search to learn more um, and get out and find some of those 40 snowflakes in the area. Also putting a call out uh, for volunteers. If you're local, if you're interested in volunteering with us um, in relation to tonight's program, uh, uh, I wanted to, um, uh, Again, let you all know about uh, another opportunity we have coming up. Uh, tonight, we're going to learn a lot about the medicinal plant garden at the Indiana uh, Museum of Medical History, but uh, Museum of the Grand Prairie and the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, uh, we've been talking about it um, all winter and, and late fall are interested in beginning a similar project of our own right here in Champaign County. So if you're interested in volunteering to help us plan, coordinate, plant, and maintain a new medicinal and healing garden here at Lake of the Woods Forest Preserve in Champaign County, Feel free to reach out to me, uh, Pat Kane, at my email, pkane at ccfpd.org, which I'm dropping in the comment section right now, too. Or my colleague, Katie Snyder. Uh, her email is ksnyder, uh, ksnyder um, at ccfpd.org. Um, if you're interested in that particular volunteering opportunity or would like to learn more. We would love to have some help in this new and exciting project that we're looking to um, uh, uh, start uh, and you know offer a great educational and, and healing experience for our community. Um, for more info about these programs and everything else happening at the Museum of the Grand Prairie and Champaign County Forest Preserve District, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, or visit us at museumofthegrandprairie.org or CC fpd.org. Um, again, let us know where you're watching from down in the comments section. Have some other folks tuning in tonight. Uh, Josh from Washington, Illinois. Thank you for tuning in. Haley from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Thanks for tuning in. Sherry from Decatur um, and uh, my aunt Kathy all the way from South Carolina. Uh, good to see you watching. Thanks for watching. Thanks to everybody uh, for tuning in tonight uh, to tonight's program. All right. Um, so and now uh, to the first program in our annual Garden Speaker Series, um, I will start by saying that the theme for this year's series was inspired by another project uh, we're working on at our museum, inspired by this as well. Um, uh, we're currently working to complete a special exhibit set to debut in May of this year. Uh, the working title of that exhibit space is titled A History of Healing, and it will examine how infectious diseases such as tuberculosis, smallpox, influenza, polio, cholera, HIV, AIDS, and COVID-19 have impacted and continue to impact Champaign County and East Central Illinois throughout this area's history. Uh, the exhibit is also going to look at outcomes and ways that communities came together during these previous and current epidemics and pandemics. So to go along with that exhibit idea uh, came the theme for this year's virtual garden speaker series that we're kicking off tonight, and it will deal with medicinal plants, how humans have used them throughout history, and how you can start a medicinal plant garden of your very own as well. Uh, and as I mentioned before, Museum and Forest Preserve District staff uh, have also been inspired to try to develop a medicinal and, heal and healing garden project as an educational and relaxing space of our own here in Champaign County. I'm very much excited to learn uh, alongside you all tonight uh, how plants have been used to combat disease throughout history, as well as how we can learn to uh, grow this medicinal plant garden of our very own. So uh, enough of just me. Um, I'm going to bring Kathleen on right now uh, uh, to the live stream here. Kathleen, can you see me? Can you hear me? I can. Yes, I, I can. Hi, Kathleen. How's it going? Doing OK? Very, very good. Very good here in Indiana. All right. Well, uh, uh, Kathleen, uh, joining us from Indiana tonight uh, is going to be our presenter. Uh, and let me introduce uh, Kathleen to you all. Uh, so Kathleen Hull, MD, uh, was raised in Indianapolis and attended Butler University um, after medical school at Washington University in St. Louis and uh, uh, a pathology residency training at Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis. She joined the faculty at the Indiana University School of Medicine, eventually becoming professor of pathology and laboratory medicine. Uh, she taught pathology to medical students and dental students, was director of the hospital autopsy services, and held many faculty governance leadership positions in the school and university. She was chair of the IUPUI Commission on Women and subsequently the first director of the IUPUI Office for Women. 
After an early retirement in 2000, Dr. Hull became an advanced Purdue Master Gardener in Marion County, uh, and she has been involved in many volunteer projects, including serving as the head of the Medicinal Plant Garden at the Indiana Medical History Museum in Indianapolis since 2003. Uh, she was the author of many professional medical publications and since retirement has written an illustrated guidebook to the medicinal plant garden. So without further ado, I'm very excited to learn tonight. Let's give a warm virtual welcome to Kathleen Hull. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Pat. I'm going to share my screen now. Sure. <clears throat> All right. And then if you could, yep. Yeah. I'm working on it. Sure. Are we good? Yes, we are. We are full screen there. And then if you could just click that hide button at the bottom, you can take it away, Kathleen. All right. Well, I am happy to be here. I'm always happy to talk about this project and have a chance to introduce people a little bit to the Indiana Medical History Museum. Uh, Pat indicated that a half an hour is the usual amount of time to talk, and I will keep to that. Um, I'll kind of talk about three different things. First, an orientation to where the museum and the garden are. Uh, then an introduction to how we made the garden. Um, and what it's like. And then if we have time, I'll talk about some individual medicinal plants, uh, leaving time for questions uh, and answers. The uh, museum is on the grounds of the Central State Hospital, um, originally the Indiana Hospital for the Insane in 1846. Um, this facility was on 160 acres on the west side of Indianapolis. And after the hospital closed, some of the buildings uh, were left. And one of them was um, what became the museum. This picture is one of the original build, not original, but one of the massive buildings uh, at the hospital that housed the women patients. It is uh, since been demolished. This picture shows uh, six acres of the campus that is a long-term lease to the museum. This is the main museum building here. And this smaller accessory building was the dead house where they kept the remains of uh, deceased patients prior to autopsy uh, or burial or release to the family. I just wanted to point out very quickly that this old grove of trees here was original to the hospital grounds. And this lawn here is an area where the master gardeners are, have uh, been planting an uh, uh, Indiana native tree arboretum with the idea of, of uh, having a uh, park-like setting, but also an area where school children could come eventually and uh, see examples of um, at least the majority of the trees that are native to Indiana. This area also has a prairie patch um, that has been planted and maintained. And the same idea, it's a park-like setting, but also demonstrates some of what was native to Indiana. This is the main building of the museum. It was the building that housed the pathological department. Um, it was opened in 1896 as a state of the art facility for the scientific research of mental diseases and their potential cures. Because the state never really invested any more money in the facility, we're really lucky that it has the majority of its original furnishings, laboratory equipment, uh, patient records, specimens, and so forth. This is the teaching amphitheater. There are also uh, five laboratories. This particular laboratory is the histology laboratory where 
slides of tissue would be made and examined. But you get the idea of <clears throat> what a, um, a step back in history uh, visiting the museum is. That smaller building, the Dead House, now has a historic doctor's office exhibit, which is the entire office contents of Dr. Marion Sheets, who practiced along the old National Road from about 1930s to early 1970s. So his practice was really, you know, before penicillin and then into the, the era of more modern uh, types of practice. And then the medicinal plant garden. We started the medicinal plant garden project in 2003, and it is a project of the Extension Master Gardeners, uh, Purdue is our land grant university, the Purdue Extension Master Gardeners of Marion County, and Marion County is the central county in Indiana where Indianapolis is. Um, we spent the winter, uh, we're about 20 master gardeners on the project and we spent the winter doing research. And then in the spring, we created the first two beds, uh, built a little wall to help with the uh, leveling of the uh, triangle garden and another bed along the building itself. Um, this building in the background is not part of the museum, but a 1950s era storage building for the hospital. The first year we had about 50 different species of medicinal plants and adding on uh, to, the, to the demonstration garden through the years. As of last year, we were about up to 130 different species. And that's probably where we'll stay. Um, because it's you know it's just about what we can take care of. The museum itself is a small museum, and they uh, need to concentrate on the inside exhibits. So I like to point out that this really is a volunteer project, and all of the plants and materials have been donated. Um, we have had some uh, small grants from the Marion County Master Gardener Association, uh, but really it's been the gardeners that have made this possible. After that first year, we, cre we started expanding the garden. One of the first things we did was to create what we call the tall garden. And you can see that some of the plants, the sunflowers, the castor beans, the sweet Annie, get really big and they were overwhelming the original beds. We also started what we called the quadrant gardens with the idea that everything in this quadrant was a plant that was used to treat the respiratory system. This one was, <coughs> excuse me, for the digestive tract, a quadrant for the nervous system, and a quadrant for the cardiovascular system. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we started planting <coughs> around the periphery. Um, and that allowed us to include some shrubs, such as the uh, elderberry, some trees, uh, dogwood, tulip, ginkgo, and so forth. Everything is in, in the garden is a medicinal plant, whether it's what we would think of as medicinal plants or whether it's the trees, the shrubs, the vines, almost everything has a medicinal purpose <clears throat> with the exception of these tulips, which were, were already there and we didn't have the heart to get rid of them and a plant called uh, white snake root which is not medicinal, and I'll mention it later if we have time. The purpose of the garden is, well, it's beautiful and people like to visit it, but the purpose is really about demonstration and education. People are free to come and visit the garden um, anytime dawn to dusk. But we also offer guided tours free to the public on Saturday mornings. 
and we have uh, tours for groups by appointment. Of course, um, these activities have been hampered um, a bit because of the pandemic, especially the school groups. We used to have lots of school groups, um, but that has been uh, put on hold and I'm sure it will be um, again uh, still for a while. We also have the guidebook that um, Pat mentioned, and it's available in a hard copy at the museum if you want to buy it. Uh, but the contents, including the illustrations, are also available for free online at the museum's website. The, uh, the guidebook contains some general information about the museum, <coughs> general information about medicinal plants, and then a paragraph about each of the plants in the garden and a color picture of most of the plants in the garden. And then um, a pretty extensive uh, reference uh, section for those who want to um, study more. You can see from this picture that there's signage in the garden uh, so that people can go through on their own and um, learn about the individual plants. And the signs give the most common common name and then the current scientific name. In this corner of the signs, it indicates where in the planet the plant was native originally. And in this corner, it indicates what part of the plant was used or is still used medicinally and then a paragraph, a short uh, bit of the information in the guidebook um, about how the plant is used. We also have on-site lectures and, of course, uh, a variety of different talks that are given off-site, uh, like the one today. We have a disclaimer, and it's posted at the entrance of the garden. It's in the guidebook, and I always mention it um, when I make a presentation. This is about demonstration and not prescription. It's important that we, we are forthright that neither the museum nor the Purdue Extension Master Gardeners intend to endorse the use of current herbal remedies. Individuals should consult with their healthcare professionals. Herbal remedies can have serious side effects and medicinal plants can be very toxic indeed. The plants in the garden um, really come from all around the world. Our main way of choosing the plants um, was two things. One, they, they had to have some sort of physiological effect. It might be a mild one but the plant couldn't just be an old wives' tale sort of thing. And the plant had to survive uh, growing in Indiana in the spring, summer, and fall at our site. Here's a picture of uh, echinacea or the purple coneflower. Um, echinacea because the cone part of it looks like a sea urchin and echina is the Greek word for sea urchin. And this plant uh, was, at least at the turn of this recent century, the number one over-the-counter herbal in the United States with people taking echinacea to diminish the period of time that they suffer from the colds or flu. And there are double-blind scientific studies showing that it does help, and there is an equal number showing that it probably doesn't. But this is an, an example of a native plant that's a very common uh, medicinal plant. The uh, other plant, one of the other plants in this picture is uh, not a native plant, but one that the settlers uh, brought over from Europe, and that's uh, oregano. One of the very exotic plants we have in the garden, garden is from South Africa, lion's tail. Um, and it, in fact, is a plant with qualities, something like the calming and dream-enhancing 
qualities of, of marijuana. Some of the plants in the garden uh, are long time traditional plants that probably didn't cure anything, but they did offer symptomatic relief. And some examples of that are the witch hazel shrub, uh, which uh, is used to make a soothing uh, lotion, uh, an astringent for blood vessels, uh, good old chamomile uh, tea has a calming effect. The fever few plant, the leaves were used uh, for a long time to make fevers go away. Uh, maketh a fever fugitive is how it got to be called fever few. But more recently, uh, recently meaning the early 1900s, it was found that the leaves also contain compounds that can decrease the frequency and severity of migraine headaches. And castor bean, uh, here's the flower. It's not in the bean stage yet, but a big exotic plant that uh, is an annual, uh, very popular in Victorian gardens. And the beans not only contain a pretty powerful laxative, but they also contain the deadly poison ricin. So we always uh, take the, uh, the structure off of the plant before the beans can uh, mature and, and get a child into trouble. This slide is also interesting because it points out that different parts of plants have been used. Witch hazel, they use the twigs, chamomile, the flowers, fever few, the leaves, castor bean, the bean. Some of the plants, on the other hand, are the source of real modern wonder drugs. The digitalis plant or foxglove plant, uh, there are two kinds. This is the prettier of the two, the garden foxglove. Both of them are digitalis, um, and they are the source, the leaves are the source of the modern drugs, digoxin and digitoxin. These drugs make the heart beat uh, more in a more powerful contraction and a more regular rhythm. And that helps the circulation and is uh, a treatment for congestive heart failure, something that was discovered in England back in the 1700s and really, um, really helped patients who used to suffer from, who suffered from what they used to call dropsy, um, which was a condition where the body and the lungs were very full of fluid. The autumn crocus, an interesting crocus that the leaves come up in the spring, but the flowers come up in the autumn. And this plant is very poisonous, but it is the source of the drug colchicine. This is a drug that is used during an acute attack of gout to break the inflammation and decrease the terrible pain uh, that gout causes. My favorite plant in the garden is this one, the European meadowsweet. It is the plant that the Bayer Company in Germany used to make their uh, aspirin back in um, the 1890s. When we think of aspirin, I think most people think of the bark of the willow tree, and that is a source of salicylic acid. The black haw shrub in, in America is another source of salicylic acid. But in Europe, this plant grows uh, all over the place, um, all by itself. And it was a, a very abundant source of plant material to get salicylic acid. The Bayer Company put an acetyl group onto the salicylic acid. This helped, um, this helped decrease markedly the caustic effects on the lining of the stomach. And they named, a, they named their drug Aspirin, the A was for the acetyl, and the spirin was for this plant. 
at that time, the plant was scientific name Spirea ulmaria. So it was acetyl spirea aspirin aspirin. Sweet Annie uh, was one of the plants that got moved to the tall garden, a giant annual plant. Um, and it is terribly important now. I think most people, when they think of malaria, they think of quinine. Quinine is another uh, drug from a plant. Uh, the bark of the chin cinchona tree, which grows in the mountains of Peru. We do not have a cinchona tree in the garden. Um, the parasite uh, that causes malaria has become drug resistant in, in an unfortunate number of cases of malaria. Uh, and this drug, artemisinin, which is made from sweet annie, um, is able to treat those otherwise drug resistant cases of malaria, at least for the time being. And we here in this part of the world don't worry too much about malaria, but it still does kill a million people um, a year and make a whole bunch of other people very, very sick, uh, especially uh, in the equatorial countries. Here are some plants that we have in the garden that are the source of chemotherapy. Um, Paclitaxel or Taxol is made from the bark and now is also made from the needles of the yew shrub or yew tree. And Taxol is um, used especially in breast cancer, but also in some other forms of solid tumors. I think that everyone knows that the really pretty berries on, they're not really berries, but we call them berries on the yew tree are poisonous. Actually, the whole plant uh, is, is pretty poisonous. The may apple, which is native in Indiana, and I, I suspect also native in Illinois, um, grows in woodland areas as a colony, these umbrella-like plants. And here's another very poisonous plant. Um, it is the source of the drug etoposide, which is useful for testicular cancer. And here is an annual garden plant. Everybody who likes gardening probably goes out and buys a bunch of vinca every spring. The scientific name of this plant used to be Vinca rosea. So when they made medicines from it, the medicines got named Vincristin and Vinblastin. And here are two modern medicines that are useful, especially for leukemia and lymphoma, but are also used in a few other diseases. And this slide brings out the, the topic that you know, many medicinal plants um, are toxic. These are more poisonous than most, um, but a lot of the things that are used for medicine, uh, it's, it's, all about, it's all about the dosage. I think we've got time to look um, more closely at a, a few more individual plants. And I like to talk about the milkweeds for a variety of reasons. Um, I think everybody knows that the milkweed uh, genus is critical for the monarch butterfly. It's the host plant uh, for the caterpillar. And we've got three ki four kinds of milkweeds growing in the med medicinal garden. Here is the common milkweed. Um, we also have the butterfly weed, the tropical milkweed, and the swamp milkweed. The milky sap that's in the stem is very cardiotoxic, causes arrhythmias of the heart. And so it's really not used internally as a medicine, but it has been used to treat warts and ringworm and, and even some skin cancers, um, uh, not, not by modern medicine, but in, mainly in the past. The root of the plant has also been made into a tea which had 
uh, laxative properties and also diuretic properties, increasing the amount of urine and therefore helping to flush out infections um, or even gravel or little stones in the urinary tract. This is a statue in the garden. It's a statue of Asclepios, and he was the Greek god of healing. He's on this slide because this genus of plants was named in his honor. In artwork, he is always shown leaning against his healing staff with the single snake coiled around it. Uh, the snake was actually a, a symbol of health uh, probably because um, it sheds its skin and goes on in a, a, a new healthy way, I, I guess would be the way of putting it. Um, although it's also true that snake venoms were used um, for some conditions back then. Asclepios had a family and um, I mentioned two of his uh, children one of them, a daughter named Hygieia, who was the Greek goddess of good health, and we get our word hygiene from her. And another daughter was Panacus. She was the goddess of cures, and we get our, our word panacea, or something that's a cure for everything, from her name. Bone set is a native plant that re was really uh, important way up until about the 1940s. Um, it was a treatment for flu. It was actually listed in the U.S. Pharmacopeia, a big tome about what what to what plant to use for what uh, disease. Way up until the 1940s, it was the aerial part of the plant that was used. Probably, well, surely didn't cure flu, but it brought down fevers, it brought down chills. Uh, so it was useful for, for any of the conditions that caused those symptoms. It was also used as a poultice for broken bones, and that's probably where the common name bone set comes in. There are other plants that have the common name bone set because a for similar reasons, also used as a poultice for sprains and bro broken bones. Comfrey, for example, is a European plant that's also known as bone set. Interesting, it gets its uh, species modifier perfoliatum because the stem of the plant comes uh, perforating through this interesting fused leaf. You can see it here. And again, down here, there's a, another view of how the stem perforates through this unusual shaped leaf. So Eupatorium perfoliatum. In Indiana, this grows along a kind of low uh, woods, especially at the edge of woods where a creek runs through a sort of damp, not soggy, but, but moist areas. And it starts blooming usually in late August, early September. In the very same area, there's this plant. And this plant uh, blooms about three weeks later. It's the same size to my eye. The flowers are very similar to each other. This is bone set, and this is white snake root. White snake root is a poisonous plant, um, which is in the garden because of its historic importance. When settlers started uh, settling, uh, their, cow, their cows uh, would just roam around uh, and eat whatever was available. And if they ate the white snake root plant, um, the family could get very sick if they drank the milk. Now, this whole thing wasn't figured out until decades later. But the cow eats the toxic plant, the toxin goes into the milk, the people drink the milk and get very sick and frequently die. And this uh, was called milk sickness. And it actually was what caused the death of Abraham Lincoln's mother 
when the Lincoln family was still living in Indiana. Um, maybe just one more, the black haw shrub is a native shrub and it was like a, a little grocery or a little pharmacy for Native Americans. It had, had something like aspirin, it had a blood thinner, but mainly it was useful for its antispasmodic effects. Um, they would use it to treat not only uterine cramping, but threatened miscarriage, intestinal cramping, even contraction of the bronch uh, bronchioles and asthma and contraction of the blood vessels and hypertension. And as you can see on this illustration of this medicine bottle, cramp bark was another common name for this. We have uh, vines in the garden. I'll just mention this one because uh, the wild yam vine native to America, native to Indiana, was important in the scientific work that went into making hormones out of plant material. They were actually looking for a way to make cortisol or cortisone. But while they were at it, they figured that they could make sex hormones too. And it was the making of progesterone that led to the first birth control pill that came out in the 1960s. The yam, or the underground part of the vine, was what was used in the research. Our native vine has a root that's about as big as a thumb, but its Mexican cousin has a huge tuber that can weigh up to 100 pounds. So it was actually the plant that was used to uh, manufacture the first birth control pill. Native trees, we'll skip uh, so that we have time for questions. So um, I hope that that gives you an idea about the museum and um, about the medicinal garden. Um, there's a whole lot more to say, but um, that's all we have time for, I think. If you want to, to look at the guidebook, this is the website. It's the Indiana Medical History Museum.org. I M H M dot org. And I'm going to um, unshare, I think. Yeah, thank you very much, Kathleen. Um, <clears throat> I, I learned a whole bunch there myself. And, and um, you know, even with some of these. Uh, plants that are very common, you know, common around uh, museum space. We've got quite a bit. We've got quite a bit of uh, milkweed growing right out our front door and back door, and uh, echinacea, and right. uh, we have a, a a trail not too far from our museum, a nature trail where there's just tons and tons of may apple. And you know, I, I I knew a little bit about echinacea, but even some of these very common plants, I didn't realize just the right medicinal qualities and the symptomatic relief that that some of these plants and the significance of you know even uh you know in the in the in the in the scientific name of of milkweed and the relation to you know the greek god of asclepios right. and stuff so it's it's really really cool and i really really um appreciate you uh joining us well tonight. i find it terribly interesting and of course you there i don't know what your local pharmacies are called but here they're walgreens and cvs and you know, they didn't exist. So right. <laughs> people figured out figured out what would help. That's right. Yeah. You figure out a way. If there's a will, there's a way. Um, so um, so if you have any questions, um, uh, feel free to put those um, in the comment section. Um, if you have any questions for Kathleen. Kathleen, um, you mentioned this at the beginning. I got a, I got a question just to start, but you said that this was a project, this medicinal uh, a garden project was, you know, started by all volunteers and, and you may have mentioned it, maybe I missed it, but what was the, you know, what was the uh, inspiration? Was this something, you know, where, you know, a handful of you all were sitting around a table and said, hey, this would be a great idea. And then it went from there. Or could you talk a little bit more about <laughs> about how it, uh, you know, started? Um, yeah, well, I, you know, I don't want to take um, more credit, but maybe I'll take the blame. 
Um, because I have a medical background, because I had been involved on the board of the museum, because I retired early, because the very first thing I did was to take the master gardener training. Um, so it was, it was, there was space available, um, you know, a garden for a garden project. And, you know, my interest in history and my knowledge of medicine, um, you know, just made it seem like a natural to me. And when I brought it up at the uh, Master Gardener Association, people just jumped on board. So a lot of our volunteers have been physicians or uh, uh, researchers at Lilly or nurses or, you know, a lot of the Master Gardener volunteers have had some medical interest in their professional life. Sure. And, and about how many, how many volunteers do you have now that, that, that maintain the space? Right. Most years we have about seven uh, gardeners that come every Wednesday morning during the gardening season. Um, most of those are uh, older, retired people who can work on Wednesday mornings. We also work um, every, a couple of Saturday mornings uh, each month so that uh, people who are still working who want to volunteer can come at those times. But over the years, we've probably had 60 plus uh, people involved, wow. but most years we have seven to 10 active, um, reliable active volunteers to keep everything tidy. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's amazing. You know, just seeing the pictures and I haven't seen it in person, but uh, you know, for you all as volunteers to keep that space up, that's, that's really, really great. And now I, we got to go over there. Um, I know my, <laughs> I know my, uh, my boss, our director is, is tuning in. So maybe we'll have to schedule another field trip. We keep, every time, every time we run into, you know, somebody from a museum that we haven't been to, it's like, man, we gotta, right. we gotta go visit. Um uh, Susan has a question. Uh, Susan asks, I think when talking about uh, milkweed, would the milky sap uh, be dangerous when absorbed through the skin? I don't think that it would be dangerous in any significant way. If, um, as we are gardening, if we if we cut milkweed even inadvertently and get some of that milky sap on, we try and get it off. Um, if if you didn't if you didn't wipe it off. Um, it might irritate your skin a little bit. Um, you wouldn't want uh, you wouldn't want it to get into an open wound or a cut. But there again, a little bit um, a little bit is not going to do any significant damage. Gotcha. Thank you, um, uh, Barb, um, our director, um, tuning in, has a question. Um, so she said you talked about. Um, Forgive me for the pronunciation. Our Artisamia, our Artemisia. Artemisia. Artemisia, but wasn't some version of Artemisia or wormwood used to make absinthe, which in turn was used for childbearing is issues, named for Artemis. Of course, you know anything about that particular plant? Uh, well, our sweet Annie is Artemisia annua, for it being an annual kind of wormwood. Of course, the wormwoods were called wormwoods because they got rid of worms and other parasites. We also grow Artemisia absinthium, which was the source of the um, very popular toxic uh, addictive drink absinthe that was especially popular in Paris um, at one time. Um, I'm, I'm not uh, yes, the genus is named after um, Artemis, but I'm not. I'm not familiar uh, with the childbirth um, aspects of it. Which is not to say it's not true. There's a lot. There's a lot to learn about these plants, but I just can't speak to that. Sure. Um, uh, Debbie asks, um, you know, when adding medicinal plants, is uh, it looks like Debbie's tuning in um, from Wisconsin. You know, anything uh, particular advantage to add to her landscape when adding these medicinal plants? Uh, you know, anything you can recommend potentially? 
Well, I'm I if she's <laughs> if she's wants to add something to go out and nibble on it, I I I think that would be a bad idea. But if if it's just to beautify the garden, um, I would suggest that she take a look at the guidebook online. It does have color pictures, and most of the pictures are of the, the flower. So she could get a good idea uh, from looking at that what the plants uh, would look like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I did, um, uh, when you were giving the presentation, when you referenced the guidebook there towards the beginning, I did drop a link to that and your website in in the comment section. So folks, if you sure. are tuning in and you and you didn't see that, feel free to scroll back through the comments, but I did drop a link in there for that guidebook. Encourage you to check that out to learn more about um, the garden project um, at IMHM, as well as um, the there's tons and tons of really awesome information um, in that guidebook. I would strongly recommend it. Um, uh, that seems to be the end of the questions um, uh, that we have uh, from folks. We have some folks tuning in, which I completely agree with, um, you know, saying thank you. Quite interesting. You know, Mark says thank you. Um, uh, Sherry, thank you. Good info and resources. Susan. Uh, tuning in says as a as an NP and, and a gardener been very educational um, uh, and uh, uh, Gina says interesting talk thank you in the process of planting her own medicinal plant garden so that's really great um, so uh, you know I agree with all these folks um, uh, thank you so much Kathleen uh, for the presentation tonight I learned so much I want to you know, again, I was talking uh, offline previously to Kathleen. I'm itching for it to get a little warmer, to get back into the gardening and growing season, and 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 seeing what uh, what we could do at Museum of the Grand Prairie and Champaign County Forest Preserve District for a medicinal plant garden project. Um, Kathleen, you got any uh, any final words for the folks out there watching? No, it's just been a pleasure um, to spend some time with you. And thank you again for the opportunity to talk about the museum and our garden. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, thank you, Kathleen. Um, uh, and with that, folks, uh, thanks again for tuning in. Those of you out there watching, um, feel free to tune in on our uh, next presentation again on Thursday, February 17th. Um, but uh, until next time, I'm going to end the live broadcast. Thank you all. Enjoy your evening.